I'm going to grab your Bibles and open up to James chapter 4. I'm looking forward to this uh, study of James 4. I think we're going to be able to finish this study. As I mentioned, we, were, uh, we had originally started a, a, what was planned to be four weeks. We, we are so far, we're going to do it in five. And so I, I am optimistic. I'm not totally convinced. I am optimistic that we'll finish James chapter, chapters 3 and 4 in, in five weeks. Um, it looks like we're going to be doing one through six. That's what my goal is, to do one through six this morning. And then next week would be seven through ten. That would actually leave us two paragraphs to finish up. So we'll see what happens on week five, but um, I'm optimistic. But uh, you, you guys know how that is. I'm probably too optimistic at times when it comes to how much text we're going to cover. But nevertheless, this is an incredible text, and it's incredibly important. I want to ask you to follow along as we look at verses one through six. Chapter four, verses one through six. James writes, What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that The scripture speaks to no purpose. He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. But he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I'd have to say that the second worst part of choosing to become a friend of the world is that you make yourself hostile to God. And the only thing worse than that would be the fact that by choosing to become a friend of the world, you make God hostile to you. This is a profound verse because it very clearly says in verse 4 that the friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Hostility toward God, there couldn't be anything worse than having God Almighty hostile to you and being hostile in return back to him. I want to show you a couple passages in the scripture that highlight how severe and how dangerous this really is. If you go back to the book of Nahum, I'm going to read to you a passage from Nahum chapter 1. And there's a corollary here. It's interesting. I, I, when I think of this passage in Nahum, I'm, I af- actually think of it as a, as a corollary to Romans chapter 8. It's kind of an opposite corollary, honestly. Because if Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 31, if God is uh, for you, who is against you? It's almost as though Nahum says, if God is against you, who could be for you? It really doesn't even matter at that point. If God's opposed to you, what, what, what does it matter who's on your side? Listen to Nahum chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. Nahum writes, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and Carmel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. And listen to this in verse 6. Who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overwhelming flood, 
He will make a complete end of its sight. He will pursue his enemies into darkness. I mean, this is just one of many passages we could go to in the scriptures to describe God's relationship with his enemies. An entire prophecy in Ezekiel 21 describes how a sword is being sharpened for his enemies. Psalm 7 verse 11 says that God is a righteous judge with whom there is indignation every day. Jesus himself says that he who is not for me is against me. And so apart from a complete allegiance to God, apart from a devotion to God, that would make you an enemy of God. On the other hand, what could possibly be better than being a friend of God? Abraham was called God's friend. Second Chronicles 20 verse 7, did, not, did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? In our own epistle that we're studying, James in James chapter 2, verse 23, James says that Abraham was called the friend of God. And this is not a, a reality that's unique to Abraham. Uh, this is exactly what Jesus describes in John 15. I want you to turn here for a second. Before we get back to James chapter 4, look at John 15 for a minute. In, J in John 15, remember this is the... Um, what's been called the, the upper room discourse. It's, it's, it's actually probably from 15.1 and on, it's probably taking place on, on the Mount of Olives. Um, but it's that night that he had enjoyed the, the, the Passover meal with his disciples before he was betrayed. And so he says to his disciples in chapter 15, verse 12, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than this, that, that one lay down his life for his friends. And then think about this. Jesus Christ, our Lord, says to these disciples, you are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give you. This I command you that you love one another. I mean, he is saying, I'm giving you the heart and mind of my Father. This is not, this is not the task of a slave where you just get one short little mandate and you don't even know why you're doing it. Uh, this is a friendship relationship where he's saying, I'm opening up my heart to you. I'm opening up my mind to you. I'm giving you all that God wants for you. And you are my friends if you obey. This is a friendship relationship with God. And then look at the contrast in verse 18. He starts to describe the relationship with the world. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world... And that means if you weren't a friend of Christ, but if you were a friend of the world, if, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. I mean, think about this. There's an antithesis here. Christ is talking about friendship with himself, friendship with the Father, meaning you are not of the world. And this is always the way it goes. I actually think that James, writing James chapter 4, probably has this very uh, conversation in mind, this very text, where Jesus is highlighting that friendship with me means you will not be friends of the world. The Apostle John goes on to talk about the love of the world and all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. Uh, those, this is the love of the world, and if you love the world, the love of the Father is not even in you. You cannot love world and Father at the same time. This is the antithesis that Jesus is describing to the disciples, saying, you're my friends. And so that's why the world's not going to love you, because you're not one of them. You're not a friend of the world. They're not going to receive you. They're not going to accept you. They're going to come after you. They're going to treat you the same way they treated me. They hated me. They're going to hate you. That's what it means to be a friend of Christ, a friend of God. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. 
But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned, but now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Friendship with God is enmity with the world. Let's go back to James chapter 4. I want that antithesis clearly in our minds as we study this text because it's important that we remember that. What's interesting about this text is this text is written to a group of professing believers. As you know, we've highlighted this in the last couple of weeks. These, these passages are not unrelated to one another. They are building on top of one another, and they're building a massive case for what it looks like to be able to test and prove what a, what a living faith really is. What is a valid profession of faith? And so last time we looked at what it looks like for somebody to claim to have wisdom, but what does their life demonstrate? Does the fruit of their life demonstrate wisdom, first of all, by its purity, and then peace and harmony and fruitfulness and yield, persuasion to the truth and all that goes along is described there with wisdom from above? And so it's exposing a false profession of a claim to have wisdom. And we all have one wisdom or another. It's either wisdom from below or wisdom from above. But the proof that you have wisdom from above is not that you claim to have it. It's proven by your deeds. And now, he's going to highlight when professing Christians claim to have wisdom from above, but their lives are marked by fighting and quarreling. What's going on? Something is wrong here. In fact, it's clear in the text that we just read that these individuals he's writing to are not pagans, Pagans with integrity, just doing their thing, living their life, enjoying their friends, loving the world with a secular integrity. It's very clear that these are professing Christians, and they have a relationship with God, and they pray, and they claim to have a walk with Christ that would be corollary to their faith. But he's pointing out that they're there's something in their life that's disproving their claim. And these, these people are very religious. And if we are indicted by this text, we might be very religious. But if we are indicted by this text, we are also very worldly. And so what this is, is this is a text on how to deal with a religiously worldly heart a religiously worldly heart. And this is different than uh, your coworker who doesn't even make a pretense to love God or worship him. And this is a great text for the church to constantly be, in, be mindful of because the question comes for us who profess to love Christ is, are we actually friends of God, or are we friends of the world? As we work through this verse by verse, I do want to remind you um, what's kind of been typical in all, three, in all three so far, all three of these expositions from James. I mean, this really is categorical. James is so black and white. He's so clearly describing categories of profession that are being disproven. In other words, a false profession of Christianity, and professions that are being proven. In other words, a true Christian. He's very clear that he's, he's writing with these two categories in mind. And so as we talk about it, ultimately I would say it this way, if you are indicted by this by way of habit, by way of character, if this is what characterizes your life, then you need to take inventory. And you need to examine, can I really say that my profession of faith is valid? Am I truly is my faith living? Am I truly a friend of God? Or do I just claim to be? And at the same time, I'm also going to try to bring out some insights from this text that, that would, would help you if, if you're not indicted by this text as a, as a way of life. In other words, you look at this and you say, wow, man, I'm so thankful. I actually do love, I do love obedience. 
And I do see uh, fruitful striving towards God's will. And it's amazing that I actually am a friend of God, but at the same time, I haven't arrived. Well, then you get the benefit of seeing some implications from this text to help you see, are there still areas where in your character, in your inner man, are there still remnants of potential worldliness that need to go? And the children of God are going to look at that and say, amen, let's get rid of that. I don't want any worldliness left. Of course, there's still some worldliness left. We haven't arrived yet. We're not glorified. So I don't want to confuse you. There's, a, there's this ultimate test happening where there's profession being either disproven or proven. But for even for you who your faith is being proven that you're a friend of God, there's still an application that we can benefit from as we think about, hey, is there areas of worldliness that, that I need to repent from? So there's really two parts to this paragraph. First of all, if we're going to deal with a religiously worldly heart, number one, there's a diagnosis. In verses one to three, we need to learn how to identify worldly desires. How do you identify worldly desires? And then number two is the solution. And that's in verses four to six. The solution is to seek godly, to seek God-given devotion. God-given devotion. It's something we have to seek for and God has to give it all at once. That's the solution to worldliness in the heart. Whether it's categorical and pervasive or whether it's in an area of our inner man, um, we, the solution is always to seek God-given devotion. So let's just dive in and look at this verse by verse in the remaining minutes that we have. Verse 1. James starts with a very penetrating question, just like he did in chapter 3, verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13 is obviously exposing that there's a false, uh, a false profession there happening because it says, who is wise among you and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds done in the gentleness of wisdom. Well, now in chapter 4, verse 1, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? He's, it's a very penetrating question exposing the fact that there are, among the audience of this particular letter, there are some who are professing to have a living faith, but yet their lives are characterized by quarreling and conflict. It's interesting the word quarrel and the word conflict are repeated in opposite order in 2B. It says, so you, uh, 2B says, you are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And so if you want to bring out the concordance there, uh, I would have loved for the NAS to have kept some concordance in their translation. And you could say in verse 1, what's the source of quarrels and fights among you? And then when you get to 2B, so you fight and quarrel just repeats those exact same words and makes them a verb. And in verse 1, they're nouns, and in verse 2, they're verbs. The question he's obviously asking is, where does the fighting, where does the conflict come from among you? And that's actually an important starting point for diagnosis of uh, worldly desires. Worldly desires in our heart are often going to produce fighting and quarreling. In fact, it's already a given, because remember in chapter 3 last week, Go back to chapter 3 and look at this wisdom from um, below. Wisdom from below is characterized in verse 14 as bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And so the claim to have wisdom when your life is marked by bitter jealousy and selfish ambition is a lie against the truth. I'm lying against the truth if my knowledge of the word and my association with the word and my profession to Christianity and all of these things are promoting and producing bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. I'm lying. And when that's the case, there is disorder and every evil thing. On the contrast, in verse 17 and 18 of chapter 3, James tells us that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, and then skip down to verse 18. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And so you can see there's an incredible connection between chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, and chapters 4, 1 through 6. It just continues going. Basically, he's saying, here's the fruit of wisdom. And then he turns right around to his audience and says, okay, so what about you? Where, where do these source of, what's the source of quarrels and conflicts? Uh, where, where does that come from? Now, it's interesting he answers the question very, very, in, with another question. He answers it with another question. He says, is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? Question mark. Isn't that the case? And so the, uh, the question really is answered with another question. And we have to look at this and acknowledge the source of my quarrels and the source of my conflicts 
are what? This is a really important diagnostic question because inevitably our flesh, let's just say it this way for the sake of James, wisdom from below, (laughs) wisdom from below will tell you every single time it's your circumstance or it's the person you're arguing with or it's some, it's some sort of complication that's been imposed on you from without. It's like my, uh, <laughs> my wife uh, mentioned to me, I think, I think we were coming up on our first anniversary, and she says to me, man, John, you know, I'm, 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 we laugh about it now, so I tell this kind of on an offhanded way, and everybody's like, oh, cringing. But we laugh about it now. I think we've been married almost a year, and she said, man, John, you know, I'm just really tired of arguing. And I thought... Yeah, me too. And I don't really remember arguing this much until, well, until you came into the picture. (laughs) So obviously, April's the problem. Where do the quarrels and conflicts come from? Wisdom from below will tell you it's outside of you every single time, and that is a lie. We know it's a lie because James 4.1 tells us it's a lie. Where does it come from? It comes from your pleasures. Your desires. Hedone is the noun where we get our word hedonism. Hedonism is a philosophical mindset that you just live for pleasure. You live for your desires. So your desires, your lusts, your pleasures, that's what you live for in a hedonistic worldview. Guess what? We are all naturally hedonists. And that's where our quarreling and conflict comes from, is that we are living for pleasure. There's something we want. And notice where it's found. It says, in your members. Now, don't, don't think for a second that, uh, as if it's not an inner man issue and it has to do with some sort of anatomical or biological problem. <laughs> Obviously, James here is using the Lord's language from, John, from Matthew chapter 5 when he says, um, you know, that you're, if you lust, there, there's lust in your members in the Sermon on the Mount. He even uses the word member, and James uses that exact same word here, and he's just talking about your person, your inner man. And so, you know, when Jesus goes on to talk about sinning with your right hand or sinning with your eye. Uh, of course, the problem is not the anatomical. It's not, there's not something defunct with my right eye if I commit lust. There's not something wrong with my hand if I harm someone. And, and there's not something anatomically or um, biologically wrong with my tongue if I chew someone out and express anger and sin against them. He knows that. Jesus knew that. But that's the term used for describing the fact that we sin against one another. It comes out of the heart, theologically, Mark chapter 7. So when James says that these are pleasures that wage war in your members, he's looking at our life and he's saying, your life is filled up with all of these desires. And these desires, the lusts, the pleasures, the desires that you have, that's what's producing the conflict in your life. Now, if you're hearing that and you're, you look at the word pleasure, it's not, it's not the typical word for lust. It's the word for pleasures. It's hedonai, where we get our word hedonism. But even when he goes to use the verb to lust in verse 2, there's the typical word for lust, epithumia. Epithumeo is the verb to lust. And so what that is is a strong desire. So let's just, let's just be clear here. That certainly includes the typical reference for lust, which would be a, a sexual or sensual desire. But it's a word that's much broader than that. It just means a strong desire. So there is a strong desire, a consuming desire, a passionate focus on something. It could be personal ambition. It could be personal comfort. It could be relational harmony. It could be materialistic. It could be ambition. It could be influence. It could be personal respect. It could be a little bit of peace and quiet. It could be fill in the blank. Anything we strongly desire could be a very suspect cause of this kind of 
quarreling and fighting. And so now in verse 2, he continues in this discussion about what's going on. He's kind of giving us a diagnostic. It's like a pathology for this religiously worldly heart. So when somebody's in the church and they make a really strong profession, but their lives are worldly, this is an incredible diagnostic to start to show, hey, there's some worldliness going on here. In verse 2, he says, you lust and you do not have. So now he's, just, he's picturing this desire. So picture the heart, the inner man, set its focus on this desire. I've got this desire, something I want. And when I want that thing and I don't get it, something happens. Namely, you commit murder. <laughs> Whoa, James, I mean, seriously, let's just back off a little bit. Is this overspeak? Another, is this... Another example of exaggeration, I'm smiling as I say it, because you know there's no such thing as, I mean, sure, the scriptures can use sarcasm and all sorts of figures of speech, but no biblical author has ever overstated the case. So, what's James doing here? Well, certainly it's true. You lust and you do not have, and that has been a cause of actual physical murder in a civil sense. But I still think he's got the Sermon on the Mount in his mind. Remember what, John, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You know, you've heard it said, don't hate, don't murder, he says, don't murder. But that becomes interpreted like, hey, yeah, look, I've never committed murder. Doesn't matter what, what, what class, what degree, not even manslaughter. I haven't been convicted of anything. And Jesus goes on to show, hey, look, this is a heart issue. You hate your brother in your heart. That's the sin of murder. That's the violation of the law. You sin in one aspect of the law, you're guilty of it all, James says in chapter 2. And so here, James is going back to his brother's and his Lord's sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, and he's pointing out that that hostility in the heart, in the inner man toward another brother, toward another sister who's created in God's image, that hostility comes out when we have these desires that go unmet. And that's really the question, the question here is, the question becomes, for me to diagnose a religiously worldly heart, I've got to examine what is it that I've put my desire on? What have I set my sights on that I'm not getting? There's an unmet desire somewhere. Notice that he repeats it in different words in verse 2. B, he says, you are envious and cannot obtain. So there's this envy. There's this um, longing. It's, it's almost like a rancor. I, I, I hate that I don't have it. I even hate that he has it and I don't. And so there's an envy. There's a jealousy and the inability to obtain it's an unmet desire, an ungratified lust, and the result of that to be is you fight and quarrel. And obviously, when you put those two together, you realize it could include literal murder, or it just could be the inner hostility of the inner man, and so that's producing the fighting and the quarreling. And it could even be as subtle as, I don't fight and quarrel, but I'm not talking to you either. It could be the silent treatment. And it's the same hostility. There's unmet desires, unmet lust, ungratified lusts. This becomes very important if we're going to diagnose our worldly heart. Let's come back to that in a second. Let's finish this verse. James starts to go down a list of why you might not have these, why these, why these desires might not be met. First of all, he gives, he gives us two options. In 2C, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. And then, strangely enough, in verse 3, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Now, what's happening here? I think Jesus, uh, James, excuse me, I think James is very, very, just being very straightforward and explaining there's a couple of options here. On the one hand, you've got unmet desires at times because you never even took it to the Lord. This would be reflective of somebody who has a desire and is not humbling their heart under God's mighty hand. They're not taking those desires and leaving them with the Lord. They're not even asking. They've got a desire, and so they go get it. They're going after it. Got this desire. Okay, good. Go get it. And so, well, of course you don't have it because you didn't ask. On the other hand, verse 3 highlights there's also another option. You Sometimes, in some cases, some desires, you actually ask, and you don't receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives. You act you ask wickedly. 
I mean, he just takes the adjective wicked and makes it an adverb, and that's what's happening here. There's just wicked motives for this request, and notice the goal of the request in 3C is so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Wow. In this second option, it's not the self-reliance of somebody who has a desire. And, and honestly, in 2C, that desire that um, it, it is not, re- it's a desire that's not met because there was no asking, that could be a legitimate desire. It could be a godly desire, but it's just in pride, I'm just going to get it on my own. So I'm not asking God for it. In 3, this is clearly idolatry. Here is a desire that now I turn to God and I say, God, I've got this desire. I must have this desire. Give it to me. Now, why do I say that? Well, notice it's important to recognize that the issue here is wrong motives. He says that explicitly. I'm not not assuming anything here. It's just right there in 3B. You ask with wrong motives. So it's clear that the issue is having the wrong motives. But notice the purpose of this request is in 3C, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. So here the problem is, I'm not going to God in dependence on the Lord for God's will. I'm going to God for my will. You see the difference? Right? First John um, chapter 5 uh, verse 14 says that if you ask anything according to God's will, he hears you. And if he hears you and whatever you ask, you already have the request you've asked from him. So if we ask God something according to his will, you've already got the answer. I mean, it might be some time, but theologically, you've got the answer. It's in God's will. Of course, he's going to give it to you. You're asking God for God's will. If I start going to God for my will, how opposite of that of the mindset of Christ not my will, but yours be done. That would be the John Anderson saying in prayer, God, not your will, but mine be done. That's why I'm praying this. And so here is an individual who has this desire and it's consuming him and he takes it to the Lord and says, Lord, give me this desire. It's not God's will. It's not after God's glory. It's after a selfish desire, a pleasure. I mean, this is, this is turning God into the dispenser of my idols. I got this idol over here, and I turn to the true and living God and say, God, won't you be so good to give me my idol? No wonder James calls them adulteresses in verse 4. I mean, you know the, you know the rich heritage of that word. Adultery in a spiritual context is obviously talking about infidelity to the Lord. This is the adultery, a spiritual adultery equals idolatry. And so this is like going to to God for an idol. I've heard it even likened to a wife asking her husband for money to go spend it on an on a, uh, to fornicate. That would be close to how shocking this reality ought to be in verse 3 in our minds. How do, we, how do we diagnose this? We've already seen that we have to get to the point where we know, where we are convinced. Not just we know in our minds, not just we know on the pages of Scripture, not just we know James 4, 1, oh, okay, it comes from my members. No, you have to know by way of being convinced and believe the problem's me. The problem is my desires. It's coming from within. That's the problem. And we have to come to the point where we are convinced that it's not just me, but it's my lusts, it's my pleasures, it's my desires, especially as he makes it very, very clear in verse 2, especially the unmet ones. And so let's just step back for a second, and let me, let me give you a picture so that you can apply verses 1 through 3. Hopefully this will help you apply it. 
Sometimes as you live the Christian life, some scenario comes up. You walk into a season of, of life. You walk into a certain scenario, a certain circumstance. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in the church. Maybe it's with extended family. You, you might even know what I'm talking about, and I wouldn't even know. It's just a circumstance that seems like a change, and all of a sudden, it seems like what's happening is this incredible hostility, this incredible turmoil. And it seems like, man, something changed really quick. And I know that James says it came from within, but I'm the same person I was six months ago, six years ago, what changed was my circumstance. And we might start to begin to believe a lie that it was the circumstance that was the cause. So here's the proper way to picture that. We've got to correct our thinking here. Our theology has to come into play. Picture your heart, your inner man, as a house. And so if you look into a house and the shades are not closed, they are open and wide open, you can see into the living room from the front lawn. Imagine to clean up quickly, we just take all the stuff in the living room and just throw it right underneath the window. And so from the sidewalk, you can't see it. From the front door, you can't see it. Even playing in the front lawn, you can't see it. But if you were going to cha- put up the Christmas lights on the ladder, and then you look down, you're like, oh, wow, look at all that junk that we didn't clean up from right there. It's underneath the window. It's there the whole time. It's there the entire time, but it had to be the perspective of a different circumstance that gave you insight to actually see what was there inside the house. So when circumstances change, your heart is not changing. It's just that you might get a perspective as to what idol and what lust and what desire is actually on the inside that's still there. So that circumstance changes and all of a sudden, latent desires spring into action or Those desires were actually strong the entire time, but there was an illusion that you were getting your idol, and circumstances exposed that, and all of a sudden you realize, wow, that's what I was after. One of the stories that I tell in probably every premarital counseling is, conversation that April and I had many years ago, and I think I shared this at the uh, women's conference. It f- seems vaguely familiar. It seems like within the last year I've said this, so I'm sure I have, but I, I might have been at the women's conference. Um, I remember we had a conversation that was kind of a st- starting to become a regular conversation, and um, first time it happened, we were talking, and we're, you know, and I'm, I'm getting all animated and intense, and, we're t- and she's just like, are you angry? I'm like, no, of course I'm not angry, you know? And she's like, well, you sound angry, and so I, I said, okay, yeah, got it. Yeah, I'm angry. Uh, sounds angry, at least. I know I'm not angry. I just sound angry. It's my tone. And so being the good husband that I, that I was, I made the correct change and made a mental note. Don't speak to your wife that intensely. Just tone it down. A month goes by. Another conversation comes up. Tone starts to rise. Intensity starts to rise. Are you angry? No, I'm not angry. Well, you sound angry. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. We already had this conversation. And I'm, of course, being a good husband that I am, made a mental note, I got, made the same mistake. <laughs> I won't make that mistake again. Another month goes by, we have the same conversation. And I've told this illustration to so many couples, and I, I still don't even know what the actual issue was. Uh, it was loosely, they were loosely connected, but it was like three times this con- a similar conversation happens. And when it happened the third time, I, I stepped away from the conversation and I thought, okay, I at least know if it was just merely a mental blunder, don't talk to your wife like a theological sparring partner or whatever, I would have wrapped that up by now. Something else is happening here. And so I, <laughs> I actually went through all the conversations in my, while they were still, when, when I, back when I could remember the conversations, I went through all of them and I started looking for common denominators. And so, it was, so if it was like, a, you know, oh, it's connected to something she said about a conversation we had about parenting and then about a, counsel, a counseling case and then, and then about something in our marriage. So I got all these three different circumstances and April's responding to all of those different circumstances and something I said in those conversations. And I started thinking about what she had said and it, it dawned on me, wow, you know what the common denominator here is? I've said this to myself, 
know what the common denominator is? Well, of course, you guys can all see it because you know how godly I am. The common denominator is she's not respecting me. That's the common denominator. And so I went back to her and said, I literally said this. Fortunately, it was longer than a decade ago, or I probably couldn't even share this without being too super embarrassed. It's embarrassing enough being whatever it was. Um, and I came to her and I said, yeah, you know, uh, April, I realize, I realize we've had some difficult, you know, whenever this comes up, it gets difficult and tense. So, um, but I realized that the problem was is that you weren't respecting me. <laughs> I didn't say it like that. I'm just laughing because it's so hilarious. And she's like, really? She's like, well, I'll consider that, but um, all I remember was you made this statement, and then I asked this question. And in the sheer face of the facts, there it was. It's true. She literally just asked me an honest question. And I knew in that moment there was nothing wrong with the question. It was a perfectly legitimate question. The problem was it was exposing And for three months, I had been diagnosing a problem as though it was circumstantial, a mental blunder. Don't use that tone with your wife. And in a nanosecond, I began to see the problem isn't the tone, it isn't your wife, it isn't those conversations. It's that you want to be worshipped. I went from thinking that I made some mistakes in marriage to realizing that my leadership is so self-oriented in this particular area that I wanted to drag April into the idolatry that I was committing. And until there's that kind of diagnosis, we, we're just playing games with worldliness. Until there's that kind of diagnosis of realizing, wow, there's an area where I, I would be, apart from God's grace, and for, by God's grace, it wasn't pervasive in every aspect of my life, but in that particular area, I started seeing, oh, there's worldliness. Without God's grace, I would be worldly, and there's, an area, there's a manifestation of worldliness right there. And I had to repent before the Lord, and I had to go seek my wife's forgiveness. And what went from being a mistake was brokenness over the fact that I had a lust to be worshipped in my marriage. Here's a question you need to ask yourself. Diagnostic questions that come out of verses one through three. First of all, ask yourself, what am I after? What do I desire? What do I crave? Think about this question. Ask that question in the context of where anger is manifest. Ask it where there's a passionate um, turmoil, where there's not peaceability, where there's irritability. Ask in that particular area, ask yourself before the Lord with your Bible open, what is it that I'm after? What do I want? What do I crave? Second, here's a pathological question that I've asked myself, and I've, I've asked this a lot of times in counseling. When, when, we're, when we're up against, we see some sort of manifestation of worldliness, it's coming out of our heart and it's spilling over into our lives, and we're trying to figure out, well, where is this? What, what's this coming from? And I can't see my way through. And we kind of have to, suddenly we have to become like a spiritual pathologist and trace it out back to its cause. This is one of those questions that I've used to try to get at that issue. Where you see the turmoil, where you see the conflict, ask yourself this question. What would have to have been different? What would have had to have been different for that conflict to be avoided, for the circumstances to have been different, for there not to have been this manifestation of hostility, frustration, irritability, fill in the blank. Now, here's some tips as you ask that question. It has to be plausible, okay? So, for example, you don't say, oh, well, if my wife would care less about how I spend my time or how I spend my money, then we would never argue. Okay, well, obviously, but that's not even the solution, right? It's got to be a plausible answer. Don't give a church answer. In other words, what would have to have been different? Well, if I were godlier. Well, of course, if you were godlier, you wouldn't have responded that way. But we're trying to do pathology here. We've got to be specific. You, you, you don't really get anywhere in, the, in, in benefiting from having your heart exposed. You will never deal with a religiously worldly heart by just simply saying in generic fashion, ah, I need to be godlier. No one ever gets anywhere. That's not specific enough. You've got to be specific It doesn't help with pathology just to say, well, if I'd been godlier, it would have turned out differently. Instead, 
force yourself to answer this question by saying what would have to have been different circumstantially, not by way of where I was at, my character, my godliness, whatever, circumstantially, what would have to have been different? And when you can see what would have to have been different circumstantially, you're going to be close to recognizing what your heart is after. Oh, well, if this had, if this had gone this way, if this conversation had been smoother, or if, if this would have turned out in my favor, or if the check would have actually been a legitimate check, or if this person didn't lie to me, or if this, you start just working through like what circumstantially had to have been different. Now you're going to start seeing where your heart is getting, you know, your idols are getting played with, strings are getting plucked that are connected to things that you are desiring that you ought not to be. That's a helpful, helpful question. The last question turns us to verses four to six. What's the solution? The solution is seek God-given devotion. Verse four, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? This ought to shock us. I think um, you know, if, I didn't, if I wasn't mic'd, it would be very appropriate if I was just speaking without amplification to just yell, you adulteresses, because that's just how it springs off the page. It's absolutely calling a name, and it's an appropriate name for any of us who would ever look to God to give us um, a selfish desire. What's so helpful, though, is not just calling it adultery in the sense of spiritual adultery, i.e. idolatry. What's also helpful is this next phrase, to recognize that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Listen, part of the solution is going to come down to confessing. How many times does worldliness remain in an otherwise religious heart because the pain of proper biblical confession is too much? We have to get to the point where we can identify with what James is saying here. And if, if we see an area of worldliness, or if your life is categorically worldly, you have to admit you love the world. Notice that, notice that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Look very quickly at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. This is a helpful verse to have in your mind as we think about James 4.4. 4. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, John writes, Do not love the world. Do not love the world. That's a command. Nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You cannot love the world and love the Father at the same time. It's mutually exclusive. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Notice, you can't love the world and love God. And so in chapter, James chapter 4, verse 4, he just asks the question that is obvious that everybody who's reading this would know the answer. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Of course that's true. We can't love the world and love God. If we love the world, we are hostile toward God. And then I would say to all of you who are Christians who are walking with the Lord, and you're looking at James and you're saying, man, this is really penetrating, really convicting, but I'm so thankful for it, and I want to see everything gone. Benefit even from that verse and put that into practice and just say, you know what? Even in those areas where you still see an inconsistency to the gospel and you see a tendency toward worldliness, don't stop short of confessing in that area to the Lord. Wow, Lord. It, clearly, that's, a, that's an area of temptation. That's an area of draw. There's a, there's a, there's a quick word leaning in my heart to go down this path and I'm seeing, it's, I'm seeing the fruit of that in this relationship. I'm seeing the fruit of that in my parenting. I'm seeing the fruit of that in my, in, at work. I'm seeing the fruit of that, and it's affecting how I, how I speak with people or whatever. You've got to get to the point where you would admit, man, Lord, I clearly go down that road so quickly because I love that sin. There's an area where I love the world. logical conclusion of verse 4a is 
4b, therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He establishes himself an enemy of God. If I, prof- if I keep professing Christianity, but I keep choosing a lifestyle characterized by lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, I establish myself, I constitute myself, I put myself forward to be an enemy of God. Now we're getting close to the solution. Verse 4 is critical. If we're going to confess and identify what's wrong with us, that we would even be going down that road in, certain, in some area of our life. Verse 5, James says, Or do you think that Scripture speaks to no purpose? Now, I'll, I'll admit verses 5 and 6 are loaded with some tricky interpretive issues. I'm going to try to just make a couple comments here because we've got to wrap this up, and I want to get to the application. Let me just kind of tell you where I'm at on some of these things. Verse 5 uh, is tricky because sometimes people say, hey, what scripture is he speaking about? And they look at 5b, he jealously desires the spirit which he's made to dwell in us. And then they say, oh, okay, that's an Old Testament, or that's a, that's a quote from scripture. And even as I'm reading the NAS, you'll notice that the second half of verse 5 is in quotes. I don't think that's helpful. I think that's even a mistake. Obviously, James didn't write it with quotes. He just wrote it in all capitals, no space, no commas, no punctuation, just all capital letters. It was an uncial script. So decisions about commas and punctuation, um, you know, those, those have to be grammatical. And grammatically, there's nothing here that would make that a quote. I believe 5b is just simply a James comment. It's just a James comment. The quote that he's thinking of comes in 6b because it actually introduces it. In, five, in 6b, it says, therefore, it says. Well, that's the, that's the scripture speaking. Do you think that scripture speaks to no purpose? What scripture? Well, namely, Proverbs chapter uh, 3, verse 34. God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I think that clears up one issue. Um, so don't, you don't have to look in vain for this quote that's quoted in 5b that you don't find anywhere because it's not anywhere. It's just James writing his letter. It's a commentary between the introduction of, don't you think Scripture speaks vainly? He makes that comment, then makes the contrast. Actually, God gives a greater grace. Here's the Scripture you need to be thinking about. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There you go. The other ones are not quite as simple. Um, The question also comes in verse 5b with this word spirit. It's capital S, and so that would mean Holy Spirit. The question is, is it? Is it a capital S or is it a lowercase s? Is this human spirit? Is it divine spirit? I do think it's going to be better to take this as human spirit. Uh, regardless of whether the word spirit is the subject of jealously desires, that would mean that the spirit jealously desires, or it's the object, which would mean he jealously desires the spirit. Either way, it makes more sense with um, this to be a human spirit. Either the human spirit longs with jealousy, and that's a problem. That's what he's been highlighting for the first last four verses, is a human spirit that's longing with jealousy. That's a problem. Or God jealously longs for the human spirit that he caused to dwell in you when he created you, which would also make sense. He wants your heart, your mind, your soul. He wants all of you. So both of those make perfect sense, but it doesn't quite make sense for me for just to say that the, the spirit longs jealously, and it doesn't even have an object of what he longs for. And also doesn't really make a lot of sense for me to sit for the, for the Father to long jealously for the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. He jealously longs for his own Holy Spirit. I'm not even sure necessarily what that means. So it makes much better sense to take this as human spirit. And then when we get to 5b, this could be a question or a statement. James could be saying this. Number one, do you think the Scripture speaks to no purpose? Does, does he jealously desire the spirit that he's made to dwell in us? And the answer would be, of course he does, if it's a question. Or it could just be a statement. He jealously desires the spirit which he's made to dwell in you. And so scripture doesn't speak vainly. He wants all of you. And if your heart is manifesting a love of the world, if your heart is manifesting worldliness, he's jealous for all of you. That's pretty difficult. And that's why verse 6 is then a contrast, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You think about what God wants. He wants all of our hearts. He wants our total devotion. He wants everything 
And then you realize, wow, I need a greater grace. I need the kind of grace that he gives. Here's the solution to any latent worldliness, especially worldliness in a religiously worldly heart. It's going to the God who is opposed to the proud. The proud would never go to God as a beggar. The humble go to God as a beggar and say, I need a greater grace. Lord, here's an area of worldliness in my heart. I want you to remove it. I'm, I'm thrilled for you to get glory for yourself here. I don't want to be an, an, an adulteress. I don't want to claim to, to love you, but then ha, ha, see worldliness somewhere in my life. And this is the only way to deal with a, a religiously worldly heart. What do I need to admit about my heart if I've chosen to befriend the world? You need to admit that no change will occur until you own your responsibility before God. Admit that you love the world. Admit that you love what God hates. And admit that you hate what God loves. That's the root of worldliness. I'm going to give you a couple texts here to write down because we're out of time. Here's some Old Testament confessions. The text that I think would be helpful for us to be able to apply James, especially verses 5 and 6. Write down Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 to 25. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 25. Write down Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3. Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3. Write down Hosea 14, verses 1 through 3. Hosea 14. Verses 1 through 3. Those are three texts talking about spiritual infidelity to the Lord, and they all have expressions of repentance that are so helpful for putting off uh, worldliness in the heart. And so they're, they're helpful expressions, inspired expressions, really, that would help us apply James chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Well, there it is. How do we deal with a religiously worldly heart? Diagnosis comes from identifying the worldly desires, and the solution comes from seeking God-given devotion. I hope that's helpful. Let me close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for James. This is such an incredible text. Thank you so much for, your, for being a God who gives a greater grace. Lord, I, I know this is such an encouraging text. I'm sure that for, for uh, all of us who are, who are striving to honor you, we have been convicted by this text this morning. Um, for many of us, it's very familiar. And for many of us, we've looked at it so many times, but yet it's still living and it's powerful and penetrating and always holds forth benefit. And we cherish it. We long to be more like you. I also just pray that, it would, that your spirit would bring an incredible sense of um, faith and conviction that you are the God who gives a greater grace. And I pray that... Um, for any, for any who are here and even thinking about areas where they've been seeing the symptom and the fruit of a, a wisdom from below, maybe they've been seeing the fruit of um, worldliness in, a, in the form of conflict and rancor, um, maybe uh, unrest, you know, maybe uh, disorderliness, maybe a life that's spiraling out of control in, in some area. And um, Lord, this text is calling them to alert. It's calling them to repentance. It's calling them to a proper confession. It's calling them to cry out to you. It's calling them to pursue humility, to humble themselves, and to come to you looking for a devotion to you that you must produce. We, we must actually love you with our heart, our whole mind, our whole soul. We must actually worship you. And yet, we know that that's beyond our natural ability. So we actually are thrilled to get outside of ourselves and to acknowledge that anywhere either an individual this morning is being exposed for being a false professing Christian and they do not love you and they are not your child, I pray for them that they would see that they are in desperate need for a greater grace. And for your children who are loving this study and who love to pursue holiness but are seeing an area in their life that would be reflective of worldliness, I pray that they would also go outside of themselves and look to you for the greater grace. And so thank you, Lord, for the grace to pursue you, to love you, and to cherish you. In your name we pray. Amen.